Good evening everyone. Thursday, April 7th, 2022. Time for episode 44 of The Last Admiral. We're going to take off where we left off with uh, Izzy Douglas and Captain Wayne trying to escape from the beaches of Eitzel. Okay. So right now, Firmish Knights are charging down on the Dragonian Marines, and Izzy Douglas rushes from his hiding place in the woods to attempt to intercept them. Izzy, of course, is Kirk Douglas in the flesh. Izzy rushed down on him from his hiding place, slashing madly with his smaller blades. The knight parried some of his attacks and accepted others. Racing out of the woods and across the beach, his company threw themselves on the fallen knights, dispatching some quickly and engaging others in pitched battle. Lancaster and his squad rushed to avoid the charge, but one of his marines was too slow and fell beneath the point of a lance. Turning back suddenly upon his pursuer, Stephen leaped up and wrestled the firmish knight down. And of course Stephen Lancaster is Bert Lancaster, of Hollywood legend. Falling hard together, they lost their weapons in a tangled mass of bucking war horses and individual combats. Rising to their feet despite a mutual exchange of blows between themselves, they each sought to regain control of their discarded weaponry. Fighting on, two more Marines died before squads of reinforcements began pouring out of the forest. The knights, realizing their disadvantage, sought retreat. Soldiers readied their bows and prepared to dispatch them. Hold! Izzy commanded them. Let them go. There is no honor in it. The firmish leader was dumbfounded. Unable to fathom their mercy, he trotted off with his knights, anxious to regroup and return to the fight. Way anchor marines, Wayne ordered. Get back to the transports. His company had had enough. Working fast as a unit, they carried the boats into the water, loaded their wounded, and embarked. The sea was turbulent, with energy from the incoming storm, with waves rolling shoreward in excess of six feet in height. The task was daunting. Boats capsized and dumped their contents without mercy. Lucky marines, still close to shore, tried again, but others were less so. Firmish fighters began pouring forth from the forest. Running into the shallows, they stretched their U-bows and attacked. Marines, struggling to manage their craft in the breakwater, were helpless to defend themselves and made easy targets. Row with all of your might, Marion urged as he pulled an oar alongside of his men. A strange flash with a terrifying report echoed across the water. Seconds later, a heavy object splashed into the water near Wayne's longboat. Fireworks flashed overhead, and he saw Eitzel's fleet for the first time. Dread and doom filled his courageous heart. It was then that Draco Viridus and the Viking, helpless to act until that moment, opened fire on the firmish fighters lining the beach. Their ship's catapults and archers' arrows did not have sufficient range to engage the fortress, but the beach and woods were well within their limits. Launching enormous clay jars filled with flammable oils and chemical powders that ignited furiously upon impact, raging fires soon riddled the beach and forest. Gifted Dragonian archers loosed arrows, and many firmen fell dead or wounded beneath their wicked barbs. Their third transport ship, Triumphant, turned about and sailed on a starboard tack in order to engage the approaching enemy fleet. Under the covering fire, the surviving marines could concentrate on their boats in the sea, and they were soon clear of the breakwater. Izzy watched the battle unfold around them as he rowed. His face revealed a mixture of emotions, grief, anger, helplessness, and a desire for revenge. Lancaster rode beside him, with six other marines pulling in the benches around them. 
His only desire was to return to his ship, get back in the fight, and to help his admiral escape. It then occurred to him that the latter was unlikely, and that made him madder still. Tension rose within him, and he could think of naught else to do but sing. Ten were the Queen's fleets. Sailing the globe, Stephen sang. Their hearts were bold. Hulls of black, sang another. Their sails never slack. Round shields, Izzy carolled. Stout bows and black swords they wield. To battle a pirate's plague, Stephen added, the queen did need. Built them for stealth, the marines sang. Built them for speed. Trained in secret and forged at sea, through raging storms and battling kraken, their hero's light piercing darkest night, all hail the fearless, all hail the faithful. Though death and battle is their fate, do not mourn for them, cry for those they meet. Get these boats in the water, Captain Cagney commanded in the next chapter. It's entitled The South Beach. He and the corporal loaded top into their longboat, gathered a squad of marines together, and carried it down to the waterline. The surf was up, and tall waves crashed intermittently onto the beach. Archers began firing down at them from the cliff tops, while the pursuing regiment of footmen worked their way down to the beach. Corporal Cagney directed, Get Top back to the ship. You're not coming with us, sir? I'll be along, he replied with a smile. Now get going. Move out. On the double, Marines. Rushing along the beach, he helped undermanned crews get their boats in the water, and then moved on to the next. His own ship, Draco Precy's, and Captain Norris's vessel, Invincible, were engaging the advancing regiment from the sea. Launching a withering hail of arrows and hundred-pound orbs of exploding flame, the hillside approached to the beach, and the grassy sand dunes that bordered it became a deadly gauntlet. The third ship in their group, Sea Crusader, captained by Carlos Lane, attacked the south fortress with magic and flaming arrows, drawing the devastating battlement fire away from them. It gave them just enough time to put out to sea. Uh, Draco Precies, or Guardian Dragon, <clears throat> and Gauntlet is a type of military punishment in which a victim is forced to run between two lines of men who struck them as they passed. Okay. And the next chapter, we find out what happened to Captain Norris, who was, of course, Chuck Norris, my incarnation, Charles Norris, after he was wounded from his tremendous fight and leaping off the cliff. Captain Norris fell more than a hundred feet over the cliff and onto the jagged rocks at their base, landing as lightly as a feather. He heard the avalanche behind him and dove for cover between the cleft of two barnacled boulders. Huge logs smashed into the ground all around him with such force that the boulders to his right and left were pile-driven deep into the sand beneath them. Without options, he covered his face with his forearms and prayed. Somehow, miraculously, the log ceased to fall, and he remained unharmed. Crawling out through a tight opening in the chaotic mass of tree trunks, he worked his way out of the jumble and sprinted toward his company. Eastward and to his left, just beyond the dangerous rocky shoals, the sea crusader took a staggering hit amidships, and a massive fire erupted, engulfing her mainsail. Sailors, covered in caustic flames, leaped overboard in an attempt to extinguish themselves. The fire intensified, and Norris knew that the blow was likely the ship's death knell. The last of their boats embarked just as his own ship engaged the approaching army. He ran faster. Good to see you, Charles, Cagney said. I've been expecting you. Good to see you too, Jared, Norris replied. Now let's get the hell out of here. Launching the long boat into the surf with their squad, they boarded between incoming breakers and rowed with all their might. Keep the nose into the waves, Marines, he directed, but it was hardly necessary because they were all expert sailors. Firmish archers who had made the beach engaged them. 
Arrows struck the hull and plunged into the sea around them, but the chaotic ocean swells rose and fell, making the difficult targets. Their longboat tossed about, but luck, skill, and desperation proved enough to get them back to their ship. The wind increased, as did the sea. Rockets exploded, revealing yet another fleet off the coast further south. Three more incendiary balls struck the sea crusader and devastated the ship. Helmsman, Norris commanded, set a starboard tack towards the crusader. I need to be on my ship, Cagney said in frustration. Signal Pracy's to follow, Norris ordered. I, Captain, the signal master replied. Don't worry, Jarrett, we'll get you back. Your first mate is a good man. He knows what to do. The hilltop forts had their range now and engaged them. Missile fire and hurtling projectiles splashed into the sea all around them as the enemy adjusted their fire. Norris remained calm, but he knew that to stay where they were had only one possible outcome. They reached Lane's ship as the last of her burning masts were slipping beneath the waves. Reducing speed, they plucked thirty marines from the turbulent waves. Arrows raked the ship. I'm sorry, where are we? Uh, beg your pardon, I get to back up a little. Uh, I noticed my phone is about to die, but hopefully we can continue to get through the episode. Okay. They reached Lane's ship as the last of her burning masts were slipping beneath the waves. Reducing speed, they plucked thirty marines from the turbulent waters. Arrows raked the ship, and the battlement artillerists scored a minor hit that set fire to the poop deck gun wall. Sailors immediately went to work extinguishing it. Scanning the surface of the burning sea, they spied no more castaways. Ho oh there, sailor Norris said to an exhausted marine. Is Captain Lane among you? He was on the forecastle when it was hit, sir, he replied with an excruciating look. Everyone burned alive. Norris placed a firm hand on the Marine's shoulder to steady him and turned his attention east to the past and past the port beam. Their new position revealed the absolute hell that the inner harbor had become. Their own ships were engaged in a desperate battle trying to win their way back through the channel and escape, while Eitzel's fleet was closing in on them from the north and the south in an enveloping maneuver. He would try to keep their avenues of escape open for as long as he could. Conning, he ordered, turn us four points to starboard. We will engage the southern fleet. We'll last longer against them, Cagney observed seriously, than against that fortress. Captain, First Lieutenant Lee reported, Pracy's is on fire. June Lee was a daring, physically perfect dark elf with a childish good looks, satin black hair and dark eyes. Behind them, but still following, Cagney's ship was aflame on the port quarter, but the crew seemed to be controlling it. Keep an eye on them, June, Nora said. Full and by. Full and by, echoed Lee. And the next chapter is entitled Blackbeard. <clears throat> Captain Edward Teach stood, past by, stood fast by the stern. Tall and broad-shouldered, his voluminous black beard rose high on his face, growing nearly to the level of his eyes. His captain's coat draped to his thighs. Spun of blue linen, its buttons were silver. Gray pants, boots of black, and a triangular cap completed his attire. A pair of unpredictable flintlocks and a cutlass hung from his weapons belt. Damn all of this smoke, he cursed as his ship, Queen Anne's Revenge, carefully navigated southward toward the heart of the battle. The wind was picking up from the east, which helped to clear the air but forced him on a port tack that slowed their progress. Ah, you will not escape us this time, little fox. I will have your head swinging from my gibbet by dawn. Coxswain. Adjust our course three points to starboard. Bring us in line with that flagship. Aye, sir, Sergeant Joe Garside replied. Joe was a capable deck sergeant and a gifted helmsman. His rectangular face had a strong, muscular quality 
and shining intelligent blue eyes. In height and build he was average and yet square-shouldered and strong. His hair was short-cropped, neat and light brown. And although his smile was usually straight-lipped and toothless, he sometimes forgot himself and smiled broadly. Searching the waters ahead of them, he kept a wary eye for approaching obstacles and expertly adjusted their course. A red-fletched, black-shafted arrow struck the wheel between his hands and embedded itself, breaking it off between his hands. His eyes widened with fear and anger. Drow bastards, he cried, just as another streaking arrow cut his next epithet short. When I get my hands on, he grumbled, while ducking another. But his work soon became too busy for words. <clears throat> and this book is dedicated to Joe Garside, my late friend and uh, wonderful dungeon master. I talked about him before. There's Sergeant Joe Garside on the deck of Queen Anne's Revenge. Okay. Captain Teach. I know some people say Thatch. It's spelled Teach to me. Captain Teach searched for his archenemy on the decks of Terribilis, through the lens of his spyglass and found him. The Sea Fox stood calmly, issuing commands as if he would soon be the victor. It was hard for a man such as him not to admire him. Damn you, kid, he said to no one in particular. You'd better not sink him before we get there. Assemble the boarding party on the main deck, he commanded. Mr. Vern, let it be known that no one is to kill the fox except for me. Aye, Captain, his first mate replied. Vern was a distinguished-looking sailor of middle years, with a wispy head of graying hair and a full beard. His forehead and nose were prominent, but not overstated. His eyes seemed kind and trustworthy, as was the man who bore them. His long blue sailor's coat and standard uniform were impeccable. Captain Teach considered him among the best and wisest of men. Around them, the harbor was in chaos, and there was still a wide expanse of burning waters and sinking ships to pass over before they could engage. Suddenly, a great burst of flame engulfed the mainsail of the adventure galley, and a tremendous blast cracked their mizzen at its foundation. Black magic! Teach muttered superstitiously. Well, we've got some magic of our own. Bring the rockets forward, Mr. Vern. We'll burn their sails down. Loading simple, large, four-inch diameter paper fireworks into angling tubes, his sailors put fire to fuse and launched an aerial assault against Terribilis. Disrupted by the wind and a general lack of accuracy, most of the rockets fell into the sea or exploded harmlessly into the open air. A few generally reached their target, but some strange invisible barrier prevented the missiles from striking their target. Archers, he directed, pointing to a stout figure standing atop of the enemy archer's tower, a thousand pieces of gold to the sailor who slays that wizard. That's where we'll end next time. We'll get back to Lord Guy, the Archmagus, in the next chapter. And, uh, of course, I had to put Jules Verne in the book with a cameo, my favorite author. And, of course, uh, a great um, character to have in any nautical battle, Jules, Jules Verne. Thank you. Have a great night.